so the audience before definitely warmed you up. But I'm here to talk briefly because I'd like to actually entertain some of the thoughts and questions that were raised. Um, uh, you know, I spent about 30 years in government service in the areas, uh, pretty much uh, anything related to acquisition I had um, experience opportunities in. I was very blessed. And I have to talk in general that what you're doing is absolutely the right thing. Raising questions about this particular area is very important for our senior leadership to have thoughts about other ways to help us serve our public. And so really, when we talk about government service, you all know that in general, our industry partners are actually decent citizens. They care about uh, national security. They have their sons and daughters overseas, and they're all very concerned about um, providing the best product for the value, et cetera. But there always is those that are not. Uh, I, my husband, who was a Marine, had a state statement because it was after 34 years of service. He saw this, that 10% of your people will basically be doing something untoward or even illegal at some point that you have to manage. So there's always going to be those people. And then in, in some ways, you kind of look at it akin to a tax form. People are going to study the system to find manners and ways of getting access to a broader opportunity, some of it ethical and some of it not. As a public servant in, or in any leadership position, your goal is obviously uh, to execute the Congress's and the administration's uh, policies and goals for national security, and of, often uh, we consider that also in the protection of the public's good. And there is a balance between those two entities, national security and public good, and that's actually a foundation for a risk trade that was uh, discussed earlier about what point do you break chalk and just go because you have to take care of lives. You know, one of the things that we have as a foundation is materiality when we do business. When we take a look at what we do in competition or in sole source, we have an issue. How much does this warrant our attention given what we have for our resources as a government entity? And when you take a look at what they're doing, do you guys mind if I wander around? I'm an ADD person, sorry. I'm failing at retirement. Um, so if we, if we take a look at what we care about when you look at what we have for our risks and trades, we have, particularly in an environment that's talking about downsizing the government, a limitation on our ability to perform all of the aspects of what we need to do. But I'm going to talk about some things that I think, as a government as a whole, we can engage in that will provide for uh, alternatives to these problems that will allow us to focus in on that. And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but if you think about risk, we have to say, OK, 90% um, of our spend, maybe I'll be pessimistic, 80% of our spend is reasonable and it has value and it has good um, teammanship uh, in a business uh, format between a partner and industry and ourselves. So what, how and when do we take into account the 90%? Well, what's interesting and it's been brought up, the life cycle of a management of a program has a development to a production and then there's a sustaining activity. The greatest cost that we bear is in the sustaining activity. Although most of the things you see in the press are actually in the development. You've seen the F-35 and the negotiations. And a tool that we used there was a unilateral contract decision. And if you understand that, we did not accept the price that was being offered to us and we proceeded down the path of pursuing a unilateral action. We have that. It takes a bevy of lawyers and it takes a bevy of people really to take risk because as you know, uh, there is a, uh, a balance between industry and Congress and ourselves as to how much and where we go. There's a lot of people who are employed. We have to take care of the public as well as not just the national security on the interest of employment as well as uh, how much of the spend. Those things are all normal to you all. You all probably live in this environment, so your concerns are on the line of, hey, we've got people who we see, and I've read the articles and I have a uh, feeling for this, who are studying the government to understand how to, quote unquote, uh, like I mentioned earlier, beat the tax form. So what do you do? Because the majority of this is not illegal. Let's put the illegal to the side because those people will be tracked down and they will be taken care of, okay? But how do you know if they're doing something illegal or how do you know if they're doing something unethical or something that isn't in the best interest of the public? Well, we have very limited tools, but we have some, and we need to develop more. We have some automation in our systems. In fact, when uh, DCMA and DLA uh, execute procurement activities, not what we normally traditionally think of as contracts. Contracts are different than procurement actions. Procurement actions are a contract which expends the public fund, 
But procurement actions are things along the quantity buy of like an, a parts at a, a bolt level or a um, specialty metal area where you buy a certain inventory in order to provide a supplier. A lot of those are at obsolete parts or sole source parts. They may be done through va various vendors, but you're going out with an automated um, purchase request. Uh, the people provide the information in accordance with the automation that's out there. And the automation has certain triggers. If you exceed a certain price within a certain period of time, we're going to raise our hand and we're going to check into you. Well, are those right? Perhaps not. Well, if you always stay below those thresholds on a repetitive basis, you can defeat the system. You just stay one point below. We don't have yet a mechanism to capture that, and we're going to get one. And you're all helping us to get one. Raising up these concerns will allow us to find the means of addressing an investment requirement into our big data to allow us, while we consider and protect our national security, to go in and find where egregious or abusers of the system, bad behaviors are being exuded. So all of you, in fact, I had this wonderful opportunity to insert myself um, into Andrew Hunter's uh, discussion. If you guys know of tools or opportunities, bring them to the government. Please, give thoughts on the table. Let me talk about another one. IP was discussed. Intellectual property is a big juggernaut of an issue on the Hill. Not unlike commerciality, it's the protection. It's the nugget that a corporation thinks is their business model. It gives them something that they can sell where no one else can compete in that space, and it's an edge. It has various levels of it. However, at one point in my career, I can tell you I actually went to the lawyers to request to take unilaterally IP from an industry partner because I was not getting to a negotiated contract and I had an urgent national security issue. And I did. I had to deal with about two years afterwards of legal issues. But if you have, there are methods to go into it uh, to on behalf of the government, when you have a national security issue, go in and take access to intellectual property. Okay? Do we use that? No. It's a very rare, rare, rare situation. Rightfully so. We are, thank God, still a capitalistic organization, country, place. And we want to make sure that we are not, as a government, too heavy-handed in our activities. Another thing is open architecture. How many of you are familiar with open architecture? Oh my god, only one, two. <laughs> open architecture means that you own the interfaces. That is not intellectual property. Owning interfaces means you know what's going into a golden nugget or a component or a part and knowing what's going out. So what can you do? Re-engineer a part. So if you have a peculiar algorithm for the Patriot missile system for doing its final end game logic to do an engagement, I don't need your unusual protected IP, intellectually proper, where you went and spent your own dollar to buy it. I want to know what goes into that, feeds that algorithm, and what comes out, and how does it work. Because I can use that to go into the public and competitively compete for, I have this, I need to have this as an outcome. Show me how you can provide that as an alternative to what I have. Does that make sense to you all? Another is, my god, technology is advanced. 3D printing. Industries themselves, large corporations, OEMs, are looking how they can back engineer and manufacture where they're seeing egregious behavior. It's a disincentive. Why am I using these tools rather than hammering these guys? I have been, like I said, in the government for over 30 years. And God bless us, we have this tradition of uh, punishing everyone for the fault of few. Moshe mentioned this earlier. We can be awfully heavy handed. When we act upon an, uh, what we find, and we all do, find this uh, abuse of trying to find the loopholes in the system to buy or bring profit to themselves that's not necessarily reasonable, we have this problem where we want to smash it and prevent it from ever happening again. And oftentimes when we legislate that or put into place policies, we create a larger burden and a larger cost and a larger risk overall to the system than we initially intended. So for the small fault here, we burden the 90% or 80% on the right. We can't do that. We have to be thoughtful about this. And by the way, people are employed. 
you know, a lot of these small uh, sole source air space type of parts are made by, you know, mom and pop uh, organizations and they're on the thread and they're basically or, um, procured by a larger organization that imposes their corporate will on them inappropriately oftentimes, but they're people. And we don't want to lose the part, we want to change the behavior of the corporate leadership. And there are means to do that. And that's where we need to target. We don't need to target the innocent, we need to target the people that are abusing this and we need to find means of creating a dynamic that causes them to change it. Legal, yeah, go slam them in jail. But when it comes to this area of materiality, when the majority of what our spend is going to is through the right process with the right industry customer focus, I don't need to create an environment where everybody carries the burden of another fill in the blank uh, clause in my contract where you have to provide me information to the nth degree and somebody else who provides this in an appropriate form has to pay for all of that work being done. Shay Asad brought up this morning for you that we're in the class, uh, in the class, sorry, <laughs> going back to my university days, uh, that we're in the room earlier. He mentioned that I had done with some very brilliant um, people a study on what the burden on industry was of government practice. And it involved DCMA and it involved others. And what we found was as industry actually had an advantage um, that was defense against those that were not defense with some of the burden that they quote unquote bore because the cost to entry into the defense industry was to bring those regulations and those regulatory processes upon them. And the defense industry that exists already has that spend done and has that capability now. And it actually is a barrier to having more competition into the defense industry world. So there is an interesting you know, a dynamic going on. How do you remove burden from industry is actually, although they uh, in the defense industry may claim that it's a burden and it has a cost and they should get rid of it, when you attempt to get rid of it, there's actually a different reaction. What we were able to accomplish, however, was we found that the government itself didn't adhere to having a common or a standard approach to implementing those policies. So we were actually able to save millions by streamlining and standardizing how we implemented across the industry those policies. So although we were not able to get industry to work with us to remove and give us an idea of what the costs were to remove, or where they could show us a reasonable way of removing some of that from our contracts, uh, the value associated with it, we were on our side able to reduce how much and how we performed the business by having it unilaterally the same. So again, going back to the risk to reward philosophy, when we talk about the, the industry and its procurement and how we and the government behave on procurement, we need to seek innovative ways of capturing this area. We need to find a way that we can do it where we're capturing those that are egregious and, and leaving the others that are performing well to perform well. I firmly believe in big data analytics. I firmly believe in uh, creating alternative sourcing that gets uh, a buy on some of the rather rough standards um, I mentioned to the team earlier. In the 1990s, there was a horrible uh, example of bad behavior. Um, in the commercial industry, uh, not so, but in the defense industry, where we had um, standards. Do you, oh, how many of you are old enough? Hardly any of you, because I'm looking up here and I can saw it. But there was a, there, we in the government had it developed over time, particularly in the airspace uh, and um, in the specific missile and highly technical complex systems that can kill people area standards nuclear standards, munitions standards, et cetera. We had a, plurifa, a plethora of standards across the nation on how you had to meet our standards to be able to sell to us. Well, it had become almost a fad, and so there were standards that were not necessary, but there were standards that were very necessary. And what changed the rules on standards was this thing called grade eight bolt. There was an expose on Bad Bradley um, fighting machine where we had a standard where grade eight meant something 
and its utility was safety on holding this vehicle together that had soldiers in it or Marines. And when they went to war, um, the intent was the standard would protect them against the unusual manner in which this, these vehicles would have to deal with terrain. And what happens, thankfully, not at war, but in a exercise, we discovered by the failure of a vehicle that these grade eight bolts were not grade eight, right? These bolts did not meet standards. So there was a requirement to be certified, i.e. you had to validate yourself that through a government entity that you met the standards. Everybody had to do it. Well, majority of our suppliers were providing us what we needed. But we had to institute and in pr practice across the department a surveillance so that we assured ourselves that we always had grade eight bolts. And I exponentially expand that to the rest of the department and all of the different supply chain elements that we have. And you can see that's a huge burden. It has a very, very hard cost and one of the costs is time. Time. People do not understand the procurement system of the government because we see this huge time. Time is a factor of what has happened historically. Uh, I'll give you my last anecdote and I'll turn it over because I think my dialogue with you would be more interesting than me just standing here narrating. If you look back over history, the reason why we have testers goes back to the period of Lincoln. There was a new ironclad to be brought into the Potomac. And the idea was that it would fire this new gun that was to be loaded on the it. And this gun was the newest of its kind. And so the cabinet and the president were uh, invited to witness the first firing of this gun. Unfortunately, the president and one of his cabinet members could not attend. However, the rest of the cabinet's members came. The weapon fired for its first time blew up and killed everyone. After that, there was a requirement to do some form of testing in a safe environment. Now exponentially add that to the rest of how we do acquisition to its day to day. And because of failures that may have only happened once or in a particular environment or for a particular reason, the entirety of the acquisition system is burdened by a risk averse approach. You can expand that to any element inside of acquisition. It's very noteworthy, newsworthy today if an airplane crashes or an aircraft crashes. So let me rewind the clock to the 1960s. And how many of you are familiar with the CH-47, the Frogger? Only the old people. Guys, go out and read. Um, when it was brought or introduced into the service, in this case the Army and the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps was the Frogger and the Army was the Chinook, it was crashing on average once a week. Nobody put it in the press. Wasn't in that time something that gathered attention. But today, if we have one crash of an aircraft, they threaten to cancel the program. How many of you are familiar with the C-17? That program was nearly dead. Oh my God, cost overruns, poor performance today. It is considered one of the stellar examples of an aircraft. It is the high, it's probably the most highly depended upon aircraft for support in the, t in the type of supply that it provides. So we have a very short vision. We have a short ability to retain historical facts when we look at the present. And we need to think about it as we're looking at this particular issue on how we want to approach it because we don't want to have us sitting in a different form and a different person up here talking by virtue of not thinking through this issue carefully. So I'm gonna leave it at that, and I invite your questions. And I know you all got heated up, but some of you left, so maybe it won't be so hot. But please, I'm pretty good as a target. So I, I think I just asked the same thing I asked the last panel, which is, um, you know, you have a, a, a situation, as you mentioned, it's sort of like, someone's uh, figuring out all the rules and sort of uh, going one inch below the line and repeating that process. Um, you, you mentioned that that might be unsustainable, or, or I'm curious, what are the creative solutions or why, why, why are you confident, whereas the last panel seemed to be, think that there was nothing wrong with that? 
Um, why are you confident that that wouldn't be able to you know, continue? So let me divorce you of one thought that you had in your sentence. I don't think that the people on that table, having known them for as long as I have, don't care about it. They do. I will say, however, many of us, and I happen to be one of those people who's kind of like uh, the little red rabbit, the pink rabbit that just keeps around, are almost beaten to death. Because the change in times, read the history on this. We go from one spectrum to another spectrum on the same issue. In the 1998 to 2001 time frame, everybody wanted to unburden the government from all of the rules and regulations and standards because they were so onerous, right? And so they pulled everything away. They decimated the workforce. 75%, I have historical data on this, of the Acquisition, the designated acquisition workforce was removed. So we've only gathered back 15% and we're stopped. Now, how do you regenerate that workforce? As you know from the CIA analysts after the post-Cold War, you can't regenerate them fast. And experience matters more than education. Sorry. I, mean, I care about it. It's necessary to have education and training. But experience is not gained by reading. <laughs> And there's good experience and bad experience. So what you have is a place where a lot of people are doing what they have been handed to do for the right reason, because the climate and the pressures, particularly from the press and from the Hill, have sent them in many directions over time. We, believe me, as a government uh, member when I uh, was in the government, and today, even as I'm not in the government, care a great deal. We very rarely have enough funding to do what is needed for our military. And a lot of that is because of these odd mannerisms of which over time we've developed a system. And the system is complex and integrated. And we need you all with the bright questions and the bright minds to help us see things better and help us find means of going in after it. Um, the data analysis, we have to bring cyber together with the data analysis. You need to actually see the mechanisms. I think there was a lot of efforts and there still will continue to be a lot of efforts for reform. The discussion on what should the FAR be related to, mission only or mission and interest of the public. Can you imagine the debate on that five years ago? How about prior to Goldwater Nickel? Um, if you ever want to read a book that will help you, because you guys are really bright from what I'm seeing, there's a book called Arming the Eagle. It's thick, but it's an actual really well-written book, history, from George Washington time. And it'll talk through all of the things, legislative and otherwise, historical example, descriptions of legislation, et cetera. And it'll give you a sense that history could help us change and define our future differently. I am praying for change. When I entered into government, I was a GS-5. I'm a professional engineer. I worked for the Marine Corps. There was all of us, a uh, total, I think, of less than 400 across the entire world of government people, uh, civilians that worked for the Marines at that time, 1985. Yes, I'm old. At that time, I was able to do anything and everything that they would push me in front of. I got to go out and test the M1A1 tank up at Churchill, uh, Aberdeen. I was able to drive an Aegis battle cruiser. The wheel's actually only this big, for those that don't know. Um, there was huge things that I was allowed to do, and I gained experience very quickly because the environment was different. Within 10 years, civilians couldn't get in there because somebody had been hurt at some place. And suddenly, you couldn't do things. So if you take a look over time, you can start gathering up what needs to be undone as well as done. And I encourage you to keep at this topic. The, the, the people in this current environment, I think, are very willing to listen. They were in the past. There's a change now, change in the terms of Machiavellian, and, and uh, you all know is an opportunity. It's not a loss, Clausewitz. So take an opportunity and put this out. Keep writing. Keep helping uh, senators submit letters, talk about this in a public forum, but think in the back of your mind where you want precisely to have your impact. And think about how you get that impact so that people don't have the mechanisms to continue to do this. Yes, please. 
So I, I want to kind of lay out a historical narrative and then see if you agree. Um, uh, it seems to me, and I'm not a, I don't really know that much about the defense industrial base. I think about competition policy that there's there's kind of um, two mo two eras if you want to think broadly about acquisition. There's the era before the Last Supper concentration yes. and private equity roll up into the defense space, and the, there's the era after that. And it doesn't matter what you do, um, whether you, you do a lot more kind of micromanagement with regulations or deregulation, if the fundamental structure is concentrated or deconcentrated, it's going to operate very, very differently. So I hear, when I listen to talk about procurement reform, or, or um, I read the interim report of the 80809 panel, um, it, it didn't say anything about kind of procurement up here at the capital structure level, mm -hmm. um, thinking about M&A, thinking about um, private equity, thinking about actually how corporations are structured and restructured. It's all down here at the parts level and, and looking at cost data. Um, is that a fair kind of historical reading, the pre Last Supper, post Last Supper, um, and then if it is, is there a case to be made for much more aggressive reform in the capital structure level, antitrust level, um, uh, yeah, ca capital markets level? So your history lesson is good. I'll add a couple nuggets to it. As a result of the Last uh, Supper, there was a meeting because all of a sudden, there was no people bidding into the market of defense. And the ones that restructured themselves to be iconic the way they are, the Hughes's, the McDonnell Douglas's, all back even was there, <laughs> lit and data system went under because somebody said, fixed price development. Um, yeah, so we went to industry and said, well, how do we get you back in the game? The formulation at that point in time was most of the larger industries had the full uh, designed to field and support organic. OEMs were really OEMs. They weren't integrators. They actually had manufacturing. They had capital assets. They built. They stored. They designed. They had research cells. Does anybody remember Westinghouse? I mean, there were some phenomenal labs. I remember going to them because they actually wanted me to go play, and I had the greatest time, you know, little engineers wandering around sucking out and missiles and radars. If you think about that at that time, look at what we have today. After they changed the weighted guidelines, after they changed the weighted guidelines, what the dynamic of industry is now. Most large industry have a very diverse portfolio and they're structured to buy whatever it is that makes their development of an entity or commodity happen. Why, you ask? You need to ask. Read the 1970 NASA competition guideline. It is incredible. It's an excellent, it can perform today. In fact, as I think they dusted it off to write the new competitive guideline. But the point is, in that guideline, it talked about a different dynamic than what we have today. We're not going to go back to that period. We can't. We're now a global supply. Anybody who thinks that defense isn't global has totally missed what happened over the last 10 to 15 years. Our supply chains, the, I mentioned in the meeting, and you were there, but I'm going for the audience, there is over 200,000 components in the F-35. 200,000, and I'm not talking about the lowest replaceable unit. I'm talking components. That's a sub-assembly level. And you have to provide logistics worldwide for that asset because, of course, Brits have it, Italy has it. How do you make sure that you understand that full pricing and that costing? I, I am a, I, I worship Shay and his team because they've done some phenomenal work. Doesn't mean that there's not more to do. There's tons more to do. We just don't have enough intellect and capacity to throttle it all. And we need this automation that we were talking about earlier. But I cannot go back to having a um, OEM that does end to end. 
It's just not going to be feasible, not in the today's situation where strategic relationships have been built over multi-years, right? So, so subs, so if I'm, a, uh, if I'm a prime to a contractor, I actually may have a subdivision of my organization subbed a third tier to me. Think about it. So I may have a prime, prime relationship, and then I might have a prime, sub, prime relationship. I went and did for the Missile Defense Agency with a brilliant lady by the name of Carla Jackson and a gentleman who passed away, God rest him, uh, Barney Clayman, uh, trying to do an analysis of the ground-based missile defense system. And I'm sorry, acquisition war stories, everybody go and have a drink. But if you look at it, we did an analysis to the lowest tier that we could possibly found and we discovered we just were running out of gas, it took me two years. But I found in enough of the structure that I could actually understand where the value was, the value chain was, so that I could offer up the system for competition. Because I could make a legitimate case. Because if you think about it, one of the things the government cares about is in the terms of responsibility, when I have a problem with my system, who do I go to fix it? How do I make sure the integrity of the design is maintained? Someone has to own the design artifact. When I'm building with missile systems, I'm not talking grade eight bolts now, but I'm talking missile systems, I wanna make sure it lands in some adversary and not in Chicago. And I wanna be able to go back to the original design and they have all of the engineering flow down of what those characteristics are and supposed to be in the whole design so that I can actually understand that I've done the right thing. I'm not trying to make this complex, it already is, but what I'm saying is that past is no longer here and we have to live in this environment, so we have to change. We, acquisition has to change. That's one of the premises of the 809. We have to change what we think and how we think about procurement entirety. Why am I buying with an arcane procurement system, and I'm sorry, I can say that now because I'm out of the system, uh, IT the way we do? We should have a total different approach to buying IT. The procurement system for a commodity is not the same as the design speed or the turn in the IT world. We have to think differently, and yet we don't have those tools available to us. Um, so I, I warrant that you guys are absolutely perceptive on this thing. What we need is your mind, because old minds like mine are stuck in a groove. I'm gonna try to break myself free of that groove, but I will see my groove coming back and back because I only know the system as it is. But if you could do your analysis against the system and see what you think could be alternatives to it, you would help us all. You would help your investors who may be making very risky investments because we've seen what happens when uh, people who abuse the system suddenly get brought to the light and a light of day shines heavy on them and then everything goes into turmoil and all of the people that actually have done those investments start to lose them, dot com anyone, Madoff anyone. There's going to be an exposure here. But we don't want it to be hurting the people who are the innocent ones. We'd like the company to change, the companies to change, because it's not just one, there's several. Okay. Anyone else? I know I'm holding up from beer or whatever it is that you might take as an adult beverage. Uh, uh, just one more. Uh, I'm going to ask it enough. Uh, you, you mentioned that. Uh, you know, uh, you had this extreme uh, case where you had to take the IP. Would you mind walking us through that? And then, you know, any other tools that were sort of that, you know, when, when, when you got pushed to the edge, um, that you had to sort of make a tough decision uh, and uh, exert some uh, leverage and some negotiating power? Sure. I'm going to walk you through a handful of them. Um, be, be sensitive to the fact because when you go into a litigation, you cannot reveal what the entity inside of the mediation or the results are. So I'm gonna walk carefully. So let me start with something mundane. Um, I had a missile system that I wanted to buy. My budgetary cycle starts, sorry, don't know why, October, goes to October. In the third quarter, I'm dead as a government person trying to execute my dollars. It's called execution rules. The sweep up of money starts in May, halfway through the cycle. Think of what that does in the CR and it'll really boggle your mind. But I need to get on contract before the third quarter. 
because otherwise the sweep of money starts taking away money. I can, I can rationalize all I want to to the budget people in the comptroller shop, but if I don't show that I'm having progress in making the negotiation come to closure, they're not going to consider me, uh, there's a term, but I won't use it. They're going to say I'm high risk and they're going to take my money and say come back next year. So what was going on, there was a banter between me and my industry partner in a sole source environment for a procurement that I was trying to make. They went to the Hill and said, the government is not actively in participation on this negotiation. They're going to lose the money. Hundreds of jobs will be lost. I went in before them to Congress and said, my industry partner is trying to gouge me, will not give me fair and reasonable, is trying to go very far into the left or right and use your term. And I would like to really shake them up. I would like you to allow me, by working with my comptroller, to roll those funds into the next year so that I can, before they have their close of budgetary year, which was November, the opportunity to turn to them and say, are you going to make your bookings or your earnings this year? Let's see about your negotiation. <laughs> but not everybody has the ability to do that. I, I, I'm not trying to say that I was good, because frankly, it was a whole bunch of us that were really bright people that I was lucky enough to work with that were doing this. And we, we won, we got a good negotiation. I've done that lots of times. I've also created competition. A company is not doing well. I invite them to come and meet me and I stand three of their competitors right outside my door. It's a competitive environment. It may not be competition as we seem to word it, but it's a competitive environment. And I tell them politely, I'm thinking of, um, T for convenience, terminate for convenience, and we're going to talk to these other guys who seem to be viable and interested in actually providing me as a customer a good product. I can do that. What we have is not where we're at the big business sense the problem. Most of it, it's not in a big arena. It's at the smaller end, inside the supply chain, that we're really having these problems. Aging equipment, old components, Sole source components with limited certification authorities out there. That is a different thing. So if I'm in a situation like I was in theater, where I had to procure something because people were dying, and I wasn't getting a rare and reasonable, let alone even insight into the cost, I unilaterally went. Because I could go back. I had to have, like I said, a bevy of lawyers, because I'm not a lawyer, I'm an engineer, and I'm kind of brutal, candid. And I said, this is my problem, and they said, go do it. Then I had to battle it afterwards. What a disincentive, right? I had to spend two years afterwards, but I was happy because I was protecting lives. And I'll do that before any time I worry about the money. So we have already discussed open architecture. We've discussed re-engineering. We've discussed changing rule sets, using big data to use and trap for looking for the data where it starts showing behaviors not just in one period of time, but in an isolated and a long time instead. Uh, we've talked about uh, IP. We've talked about, um, we took, I, had, I wrote some notes because I was fascinated by your questions. And to me, some of this seems like second or normal, but for you, you don't see us doing it. So, open architecture, asking for rights as part of the procurement. Before I go out to the procurement, I ask for the rights right up front. I'm willing to pay for them, or I say that I will give competitive advantage to the person, or I will give a higher weighting factor to those that provide me rights as part of my competitive procurement, which I can do. And so if somebody gives me rights, I will give them a higher favor, even if they're what, their price is higher. Um, I can take uh, and look at uh, things like uh, back engineering through open architectures because they're required to form and follow uh, the design artifact that I put out in my competition and I, they have to legally substantiate and provide sufficiency for it. So there's tools that are out there and they aren't, and be cautious of what you ask for, legislation, they're not policy, they're, they're ways of getting at the issue right up front. Um, you're a tool, y'all. <laughs> We look to you to help us. And we consider everybody in this type of world, in this industry, and in what you do, as another mechanism to help us. So when you guys start blowing smoke signals up, we pay attention. Uh, we're very quiet about it because naturally we preserve the integrity of the defense industry and we care about it because it's our, as you mentioned, this gentleman here um, who's praying to the IT god. Uh, we have. Uh, a concern, if you would, about 
uh, not having the rest of industry abused by having the faults of one. And we would like to redress and publicly put out what we want to have as the right message so that industry who might be per perhaps doing the same type of abuses gets the message that we're uh, paying attention. But we don't want to incur costs. We don't want to put more burden on uh, for the rest of the world or to create an uh, unusual or unintended consequence by virtue of having something that we relate to one incident versus the rest. So it's kind of like a judge at a divorce. It's very hard to figure out how to balance the equation the right way. No, uh, again, I correct you. The folks that you were talking with were having the tools in front of them that they were given thus far that was policy that they were allowed to execute. They come, believe it, up to the board, but they have to wait until that policy has been put in front of them for them to be able to change. They're supposed to be, pardon me, Matt and guys, <laughs> they're supposed to be the people who face industry directly. So they have to know the rules and regulations very clearly so that they can be inside the corporation because they witness, monitor, and execute. And they have, to, they have a bevy of lawyers from their industry partner that they're working with who's going to say, uh-uh, that's not what the policy says. You can't do that. No, uh-uh, uh-uh. And, and if you don't give them authorities that they can execute or do with, they're stuck with what they've got. So what it's my responsibility if I'm the person in, and I was, and I did a lot, not enough, um, I did a lot of those policy changes to empower them more. That's what you need to look at is inside the government. That's why I'm really encouraging you guys to keep doing what you're doing because you're providing advice and, and frankly analytical data and a lot of information to the people who need to change policies to help them change it in the right way. And who, who is that now? Is that your job? Well, until our current administration is able to elect uh, no, not elect, nominate people and put them into those positions. Uh, we're struggling. So help them. Find good people. Um, find people that have a knowledge of the system. Find people who are credible, who have um, um, the right street smarts as well as the right uh, you know, education and, and experience and, and send them into the new administration because we need them desperately. Sir? All right, please, Rich. Uh, I guess, Katrina, kind of answered this a little bit at the end, but I appreciate, maybe this is a better question for Mr. Assad, frankly, but you know, I understand that the Department of Defense is very quiet you know, about what they do and whatnot, but as you know, Mr. Assad makes changes to his staff and whatnot over the next six months a year, is there anything in particular that we should be looking for that would signal, hey, you know, now the procurement officers are empowered, now they can get the data they need to make you know, proper economic decisions for the taxpayer, for example? Oh, so, Rich, you, you're asking a question that at this point I don't have the sense that I could support telling you yet. So there's been proposed legislation on the Hill, and I've been out four months, which means I'm totally useless to you. Um, but if they put legislation over on the Hill, talk to your staffers. Remember, when legislation is proposed, industry has a vote. And I mentioned some of the dynamics that go on in industry. And the balance of what happens is an outcome. And those people uh, who write the legislation must take into account their constituencies and their concerns just as much as we put our issues on the table. The public good, the national security. That balance and that work is ongoing. So talk to your staffers. Find out what that proposal is. Does it make sense? And if you have a vehicle to advise or make recommendations, um, please do say, hey, you know, you might want to listen to us because we have the backbone of insight into what the execution of the financials are and you might want to understand this and where that risk turns into uh, value or not. Okay? You. Yeah, you're welcome. Is that it? You guys are much kinder to me. Eight thirteen, all of section 800 of the NDAA. Let me have one moment and people can shoot me who know me because they know I'm doing this personally. There is a problem in the system right now. If you take a look at the authorization language over the last 10 years 
uh, Moshe at a CRS panel brought a volume that would cover three or four of these um, tables here. You can't understand it. You can't read it. It was written in a language that would appease people and make them think that their issues were this okay and in there, whereas actually the person who wrote it had a different intent for it. And then what happens is the people on the government side who are trying to interpret it get two different interpretations from two different sources inside of Congress on that what that meant. Do you know how freaking hard that is? I've been in front of congressional members who said, no, this is what it said. I said, my legal review said that means this. That's what I have to act on. Even though you thought it meant that, I can't act on it that way. So when we think about authorization language and how you, in, in the section 800, which is entirely the acquisition section, think of it as a grade eight person reading and ask yourself, do you understand what they're saying some of it? It is bloody hard. One of the best things we could do to help government people and officials and people in making decisions and also executing them is to simplify the language so that people can actually execute quick. Black, white, read commerciality. Oh my God, I got a headache the first time I read it. Very hard. So what is the timeline and what is being addressed on Section 800 right now? So the timeline given where we are, um, this is going to go into um, the probably June, July time when the conference, you want to hit both the House and the Senate. Um, you want to have them rationalize it. So the conference language right now is the most nubile. It'll be the most flexible, but as you graduate right now. Oh, this year? No, it'll go into next year's, but it'll be this year that they close on it. Yeah. Right. Yes? Well, I understand the perspective of some of our more vocal participants in the audience, but I'm curious from yours, because you seem to be implying that this thing is broken at some level, yet you know, the recent changes to uh, the regulation have allowed for more commerciality, not less. There's been proposals to increase the peanut thresholds from 5 million from the current 750. So I, just how do I reconcile your view versus what I'm actually observing policy-wise? So uh, let me find a way to think about this. So we pulled in data where we had spend, and we looked at the backlog on audits, on reviews, closeout, and um, trying to set uh, forward pricing rates, and how much of a procurement backlog there was in actually executing, because some of these we're taking right now. I think uh, General Simpson in um, ACC says it's 780 days before you can get a contract award. And what that meant to not just the warfare, but to the taxpayer. And we placed a risk on the table. Okay. Now, how do you back out of that? You, you don't have the manpower to do all of the things that need to be done. But some of the changes can be automated. They can be in a different form. The data needs to be able to be tortured and confess what's going on. And the only way you do that is you build in systems that actually collect information about what's in the market from a variety of sources and make comparative analysis. And we do not have those tools. That's what they're seeking. That's what Shea is trying to do. That's what uh, CAPE is trying to do, big data analytics. There are a whole bunch, of, and it's not just for the costing. It's for other things, too, like performance, technical, maturity, et cetera. But that is an area that needs to be improved. Not talking just reform in some simple language issues, but reform writ large on the system. Knowledge is power still in the Pentagon. What I mean by that is that people are afraid to share across their boundaries data. Um, and much of it is related to security, but some of it can be obviated. I mean, we can manage weapon systems in the security of that data. Certainly, we can manage some of this data, procurement and otherwise. Yes, sir. So I believe that when there's, there has been press that I have read that implies that people were gouging the government. And I remember that from ill wind and other periods of time where we had exposure to information 
that wasn't of public, that was made public, and people raise concern over that. And that becomes a public issue. And that creates an unstable investment environment. And that is the concern that's going on, is how much exposure, where will it lead? Will, is there uh, things that will come of that, whether real or not real, related to the behaviors and how they were executed? And how will that translate into our future? Okay. All right, well, thank you so much. This has been really interesting. Please uh, give Ms. McFarland a round of applause. And uh, thanks so much for everyone for coming. We're going to have a uh, cocktail hour in the what, in the Concord room uh, for the next hour or so. So please join us. If